isn't just any old virus that can cause a cold. It is specifically influenza virus, one of the many viruses that can cause a respiratory infection. But we have vaccines against it. We have treatments against it. So why are we still talking about the flu and not all these other respiratory viruses? My name is Rithi Kare. I am the director of the Infectious Disease Laboratory at National Jewish Health, and I'm here to give some updates about bird flu, one of the viruses that's been dominating our news. Turns out that influenza viruses are like the Mount St. Helens of viruses, and there's the potential for a giant blowout always just right near the surface. Um, in fact, despite many years of studying it, tracking it, managing it, influenza still causes thousands of infections and deaths every year. In the past few decades, it's caused pandemics. And of course, in 1918, a strain of influenza wiped out about 20 million people across the globe in a period of four months. So why does influenza specifically um, cause such bad outcomes that we're still talking about it 100 years later? The particular problem with influenza lies in its biology. Um, like other viruses, it's basically a replication machine. It multiplies, it replicates, and every time it does so, it creates little errors in its genome that allow it to mutate. And over time, these mutations collect, and this is called antigenic drift. As an RNA virus, influenza is better than DNA viruses, for example, at creating these errors and mutations. But still, this is normal virus stuff. Influenza is also a little different because it has a segmented genome. That it means its genome is not on one strand, it's in little pieces. That essentially allows it to reshuffle its genetic code like a deck of cards. And this is really like a seismic shift. It's called antigenic shift and it allows the virus to um, reassemble a dramatically new virus in an instant. That's not all. Um, influenza virus, especially influenza A, is also what we call a promiscuous virus. That means it can infect lots of different animal species. That is just a horrible combination because now not only is influenza collecting mutations over time and reshuffling in the human um, uh, influenza strains, it can also now reshuffle with strains that really should stay in animal species. So really, that's what we are concerned about. We worry about the potential for a new Franken virus that will essentially look completely different to our immune systems, but still retain all of the power of a pandemic virus. Over the past couple of years, we have had our eyes on a strain of influenza virus called H5N1, avian influenza, that has been circulating in wild birds. Think seabirds, eagles, hawks. And you can see from this map here that is spread really efficiently throughout the US. This strain of influenza is a highly pathogenic avian influenza compared to a low pathogenic avian influenza, which means that it causes very severe disease, multi-organ failure, and a high mortality rate in birds. Unfortunately, we're now starting to see that this virus has spread into our domestic chickens. So think our um, egg-laying chickens, and this can cause huge disruptions in our poultry industries because if the virus does enter into the flock, U.S. farmers have to call hundreds of uninfected chickens just in order to contain its spread. Now, an increase in our egg prices are, is not the only thing that we have to worry about with highly pathogenic avian influenza strains. Um, this strain is particularly interesting because it seems to be able to spill over into other animal species. So for example, we now have seen this H5N1 influenza strain enter into mice, alpacas, foxes, raccoons, dolphins, polar bears, even house cats. And why this sounds really awful, from a public health perspective, these transmission events have tended to be one-offs. We have not really seen that sustained transmission that we are really worried about, except in a few species. We have seen sustained transmission in seals, mink, and cattle. So just in 2023 in Europe, there was an outbreak amongst mink farms. And then in North America, the H5N1 virus was able to spill into cattle at least as of March 2024, which is when we first detected it. 
We aren't sure exactly how this virus is being transmitted between cattle. It could be respiratory secretions, which is how the virus is transmitted between humans. It has also been detected in high titers in milk, so it's possible that it's being transmitted that way. Um, right now, the milk supply that's being provided for humans is currently considered safe because we are pasteurizing our milk. But keep in mind that infected cows, even though they're not as sick, as birds, they still do have symptoms and they do tend to produce less milk. So that does disrupt our um, dairy industry. All right, so how about humans? Does it spread into humans? Well, right now we know that H5N1 influenza can infect humans and it causes symptoms that are pretty similar to seasonal influenza and other influenza. So for example, fever, cough, sore throat, um, body aches, headaches. This strain can also cause conjunctivitis, which is a little unusual. Um, but the silver lining here is that one, the spread of this virus does not appear to be super, um, super contagious between humans. In fact, so far, there's only been 70 documented cases in humans. Um, as far as we've detected, of course, there may be more. There may be asymptomatic cases that we are not necessarily looking for. But um, right now, there has been no documented person-to-person -person spread. Second silver lining is that this virus does not appear to be super deadly either. There's only been one confirmed death from this virus. And here's a really nice map from the CDC that is regularly updated. It shows where all the human cases are. You can see most of them have happened in California, Washington, then um, Colorado, followed by a smattering of additional states. Why isn't um, influenza spreading more in humans? Uh, well, it turns out that the H5N1 bird flu is actually really efficient at binding um, receptors found in birds. So if you think about the receptors lining the respiratory tract of a chicken, shown here in little green circles, um, the chemical that it's binding to is sialic acid that has alpha-2-3 linkages. Um, humans have that too. We have sialic acid with alpha-2-3 linkages, but they're deep down in our lungs and alveoli where it's harder to get to. Instead, we have sialic acids with alpha-2-6 linkages, primarily in our upper respiratory tract. And so far, that little difference has been enough to prevent efficient transmission between um, humans with H5N1. But of course, now you can see why we're worried. If there's even just a small mutation in the virus that allows it to more efficiently bind to alpha-2-6 linkages, we can potentially see tremendous transmission um, between humans. So how do we diagnose it? How do we detect H5N1? Well, right now we have um, assays like nucleic acid amplification testing, antigen tests that are used for routine and seasonal influenza strains. Um, those should be able to detect H5N1, although they may not be able to differentiate it or distinguish it. If there is a need to do that, um, the CDC has developed an assay and um, we can access it using our public health system. And in the case that there is a pandemic and we really need higher levels of testing, they have worked with three commercial reference laboratories in order to bring up um, H5 and H5N1 specific assays. Um, there are other institutions like NIST that have released genetic material in order for laboratories to be able to develop these assays if, um, if we need to. And we have treatments for this too. So for example, oseltamivir is used routinely for severe influenza infections, and it works pretty well for H5N1 infections as well. But keep in mind that oseltamivir has to be given very quickly after um, onset of symptoms or after exposure, because the way oseltamivir works is to prevent the virus from leaving an infected cell and then infecting other cells. All right, we have vaccines for this too. The 2025 seasonal vaccine will probably not cover um, H5N1, but we do have H5N1 specific vaccines. They're not generally available, but we have some that have been developed against older strains that were available about a decade ago. There are some newer vaccines that have been developed against some of the more recent strains that have been circulating. 
Um, we need to continue vaccine development because if there is a pandemic, we won't know exactly which flavor of the virus is going to cause that pandemic. So it's best to have as much broad or cross coverage as we can. All right. In the meantime, there are other things that we can do. For example, we can vaccinate our animals themselves. For example, um, the USDA actually conditionally approved a poultry vaccine. And there are other um, countries that do already vaccinate poultry, like Egypt, China, Mexico. And this means that if the virus does enter a flock, you don't have to cull many additional uninfected chickens. Uh, and that protects a bit of the the poultry industry. California declared a state of emergency in December of last year. Um, that allows dollars to flow to that state in order to develop the system in case there is a pandemic. Um, Finland and Canada are recommending vaccination of high-risk um, activities and workers, for example, those at fur farms or those working with animals like poultry or cattle. And so just to summarize, we have had our eye on this uh, avian influenza strain, H5N1 bird flu, um, that appears to be very highly pathogenic in birds and has been able to spill over into multiple other species. But in humans, fortunately, it has not shown to be super transmissible and the fatality rate is still pretty low. Now, it's still novel to our immune systems, but... There is some low-lying immunity from other H5N1 strains that have infected us in the past. We have antivirals and um, we have um, vaccines that should be able to cover it. If you'd like to learn more about viruses, please check out my book, Guide to Clinical and Diagnostic Virology. Other than that, thank you.